Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining our session called Navigating the Inflection Point, Implications of the Current Downturn for Auto Suppliers and Actions to Take Now. Um, for context, you know, we, we understand from talking with, with many of you, um, many of our corporate partners, that times are tough and many of you are experiencing revenue declines or supply chain disruptions, uh, which can lead to budget cuts or even furloughs. And at the same time, we know that, that innovation is important. And so the challenge is how do you approach it now? Uh, so with that in mind, we've invited Bain and Company, uh, the world's leading consulting firm, to share their views on the current economic climate, common mistakes from cost cutting, and best practices for innovating in a downturn. So we have a jam-packed session for you. Uh, let's briefly touch on the agenda. So first, um, I'm going to walk through these opening remarks. Or actually, before we go through the agenda, I, I suppose I'll say who I am. Um, I'm Adam Jansen. I'm uh, the director of Plug and Play Detroit. And, and you'll be hearing from my colleague as well. His name is Mark Boucher. He's from our ventures team. Um, and as for the agenda, uh, first, uh, I'll be going through these opening remarks, do a little bit of housekeeping, show you one of the tools that Zoom has to offer. Uh, We'll be following that with Bain and Company's presentation, which of course is really the meat of our session today. Um, then I will come back and we'll do a, a moderated Q&A with any questions that the audience submits for Bain. And then we'll wrap things up with startup presentations um, whose businesses are all really kind of being accelerated by what's going on in the world today. And we'll have Gardnox, Locomation, and Roadster joining us. So many of you are familiar with plug and play. Uh, but for those of you who are not, uh, it's really important to know, one, we do venture capital, corporate innovation, we run a startup accelerator. And more importantly, we actually bring together a full ecosystem uh, of different stakeholders, be it corporations, startups, thought leaders like Bain and Company, uh, VCs and investors, governments, etc. And it's really through this whole ecosystem working together where we're able to make the biggest impact. Um, we're proud to say that we have 400 plus uh, corporations that have chosen to partner with us and participate in this ecosystem. And we've had the opportunity to invest and collaborate with uh, some of the most innovative startups in the world as well, um, like Lending Club, Dropbox, PayPal, Honey, uh, et cetera. And today's session though is, is really all about the mobility industry. And so Plug and Play Mobility was founded as a part of the IoT vertical back in 2014. Uh, mobility, we saw uh, quite a bit of traction early on, and so we spun it out into its own vertical in 2016. We currently make 25 investments per year, accelerated nearly 400 startups. We just wrapped up our eighth batch. We have 60 corporations who have partnered with us. And you can kind of see in the bottom left there the, the case or ACES trends, which are, are very well known within the mobility industry. And we've taken the success and we've replicated it all around the world. And so we have a number of different mobility offices all around the world today and, and one of them that's a little bit more popular you might know is Stuttgart is called um, Startup Audubon and we, we founded it back in 2017 together with Daimler and we've since gotten Porsche and a number of other partners on board uh, but if you look at this map you can see that there's one really important city that's missing and, and that was Detroit and so you know we, we truly believe that plug and play or that Detroit rather is turning into the next major technology hub in the United States you know, whether you look at the, the innovation that's going on across all the different corporations within the, the Michigan area, or if you look at all the startups who are innovating in Ann Arbor, you can see that it's not just true in mobility, but it's also true across IoT, FinTech, InsureTech, Health, and a number of other industries. And so, you know, in January of this year, we were really excited to announce that we'd be, you know, joining the Detroit community in togetherness with, uh, with FCA and with MMSDC as our initial two founding partners. And you know, like many of you, in, in the spring of this year, we had to think, you know, how does how does COVID affect things? You know, what what might we do to continue to provide value for all of our corporate partners virtually? And so, what we've done, you know, is we've talked about, uh, you know, continuing to schedule these deal flows with corporate partners and make introductions between them and, and startups, but also continuing to hold sessions like this virtually. So. Some of them that we've held through Detroit previously were uh, a fireside chat last week with the CEO and president of MMSDC, Michelle Sorry Robinson. Uh, FCA CIO, Mamta Chamarthi, joined us for uh, our summit. And we've also had the CXO roundtable with the CTOs of Borg Warner and the CTO of Lear um, you know, back in May. 
And so these have been opportunities of what we've been continuing to do uh, in the meantime. But one thing that, that we're really excited to say is that we will be launching in fall of 2020, 20, <clears throat> excuse me, 2020 in a virtual capacity. So one of our partners, Michigan Minority Supplier Development Council, MMSDC, has this, this huge conference every year called My Michigan Minority Procurement Conference. Uh, and so we'll be making a major announcement at MMPC in September of this year with our founding partners. And so um, I know you're here primarily to hear from Bain. Uh, um, so if you have any more questions about this, you know, please feel free to reach out to me afterwards. We can have a conversation. Um, but moving towards uh, the conversation with Bain, uh, let me do a brief introduction of the guys. So today we have Tom Wendt and Mark Godfordson who are joining us. Uh, Tom Wendt is a partner in Bain & Company's San Francisco office. He's a member of Bain's technology and automotive practices focused primarily on the intersection of automotive technology, venture capital, and corporate innovation. Tom is co-leading Bain's auto supplier and auto tech practice, and he's raised He's raised a multi-corporate VC fund around ACES before he joined the company. And Mark Godfordson, he's a partner and the co-head of America's automotive and mobility practice, as well as a global lead of complexity management, performance improvement, diagnostic solutions. He's based in, our, in their Dallas office, which he founded back in 1990. Um, and now while we're giving them a moment to you know, come on screen and, and unmute and everything like that, I'd just like to move to the next slide also to say that as we're looking at their presentation and as they're inevitably going through a lot of really interesting information for us, I'd like to encourage anybody in the audience to use the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom of your screen, and that'll give you an opportunity to submit any questions that you have as they come up. And you know, immediately following the presentation, I will come back and I'll, we'll have an opportunity to ask these questions of Tom and, and Mark. And that'll give us a, you know, a good chance to hear you know, what you guys really wanna know. But yeah, that's it for me for now. Um, you know, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tom and Mark for their presentation. Wonderful, thank you, Adam. Let me just get my screen up here. Great, wonderful. Thanks, thanks a lot, Adam. Um, and um, depending on where you are today, good morning, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our um, webinar webinar about the uh, inflection point for the automotive supplier industry. Um, so I'm I'm Tom Went, and I'm a partner in our San Francisco office, co-leading our efforts in auto tech and the supplier space. And I'm pleased to be joined today by my partner, Mark Gottfriedson, who is co-leading our auto practice in the Americas. Um, but before we get started with the formal presentation, um, on behalf of Bain & Company, uh, we hope that you, your families, and, and all your colleagues are all safe and, and healthy during these difficult times. Uh, and we offer our thoughts and condolences to those who have been personally impacted by all what's going on out there in this moment. So, um, these are certainly extraordinary times we live in, uh, especially for the automotive and, and the supplier industry. Um, but we believe that despite all the turbulences and anxiety they are causing, these are also times which offer a unique opportunity to really step back and, and take a fresh look at our business. So with this in mind, we hope that we can leave you today with the following four messages. Um, uh, first, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty uh, ongoing right now, uh, specifically in our industry, and nobody has uh, the real crystal ball to predict the post-cycle new normal re reliably. But what we know is that consumer confidence will remain low for the foreseeable future and that the underlying fundamental trends in the industry are not going away either. And this makes us believe that we will probably not see a quick recovery, but instead have to get comfortable with a sustained downturn in the industry over multiple, multiple years. Um, second, uh, unfortunately, we believe the worst is yet to come for the industry. And our analysis shows that already today, a considerable portion of the supply base is not really ready for a recession. Um, ever increasing cost pressure from OEMs and continuous COVID disruptions will probably send the industry into a even severe, even more severe crisis. Um, but on the good side, a third, uh, we have seen in earlier downturns that those are also the times where the biggest market share shifts happen. And therefore, fourth, 
we believe that the industry is really at a critical inflection point and that it requires some tough choices to balance the viability of your portfolio today with the inevitable budget cuts everybody is facing right now. And uh, we really hope that we can show you today how we can ideally navigate those in a, in a successful way. So if you move on, um, uh, you know, starting with this slide, the impact of the current crisis on the industry is, is certainly significant with global sales volumes down by about 24% this year based on our forecasts and maybe even more. If you run the numbers, this will on average take out about 80% of the industry's profitability in 2020 alone, um, not speaking about the years to come. We understand that most companies uh, have so far been very consumed with managing the immediate fallout and, and implementing rigid cash management measures. Um, but, you know, through, through the discussions with our clients, um, and as we move further along now, we believe that we need to really quickly enter into a next phase of our COVID response and start thinking about kind of deeper structural changes to make those cuts, those those you know, momentary cuts sustainable, but also about how we are balancing the ongoing budget constraints with the imminent need to keep investing or even doubling down on new opportunities and technologies and innovation when it comes to an autonomous connected electric shared mobility future. Um, and and this, this balance act is certainly not trivial and requires us to form kind of a point of view, not only about the duration and, and the depth of this crisis, but also about how the new normal on the other side will really look like. And, and this is what you know, we have tried to do over the last several months uh, since we are um, in this crisis here. And, and I want to briefly guide you through our, our insights here. So now when we are trying to understand the full extent of this crisis and, and potential recovery scenarios, um, you always have to start with the end customer. And even though if we are now getting our factories up and running again, it doesn't really help when the underlying demand is not supporting this. And uh, yes, there, there will be certainly um, a near time boost to restock inventory, which the supplier base is, is also feeling, um, especially in the US where, where inventory is down about 1.5 million um, from a year ago, and which is leading to, to kind of, you know, interesting situations. If you go out there and, and want to buy a car, um, you know, the majority of dealers are actually are asking for, for markups on, 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 on MSRP today. Um, but what we really want to understand is how long the tail is to really claw back to, to pre-crisis levels. Right? And that's why since the beginning um, of, of this situation here, we have tried to understand how consumer confidence is developing and have conducted bi-weekly surveys uh, on a global basis. <clears throat> and what this tells us is that demand will probably not recover in the short term. Uh, we see on this slide here that consumer confidence in, in their income security remains very low in all regions, especially in the US and China, um, which is surprising given China is, is further ahead in, in their recovery. And it also shows that consumers are expecting to considerably lower their private consumption in, in the US by, by almost 50%. Um, moving on to the next slide here. Um, uh, as a result of, of, of this situation, buyers are, to, to no surprise, I guess, increasingly continuing to postpone their car purchase plans. 63% um, of respondents in the US who plan to buy a vehicle this year said they will postpone their purchase and, and most of them by, by more than six months actually. If you look at China, um, the percentage there is, is even higher with almost 80% postponing their car purchase, which puts a quick recovery there as many have predicted and are hoping for um, in addition to the question, I guess. Um, interesting is also on the right side um, of the slide here, the reasons why people are postponing and Obviously, unsurprisingly, consumers in the US mostly state unemployment and, and job insecurity, whereas I would argue the, the more rational Germans are waiting for falling prices. <clears throat> On the other side, um, Chinese consumers mostly mention that they believe it's socially inappropriate to buy a new car right now, which might yet be another sign um, that we won't see demand recover there as quickly as, as we all hoped. So looking at all this research and, and the expected economic impact of, uh, of a potential recession, um, we believe that we can't trust on a quick recovery, but have to really plan with a sustained downturn over multiple years. And our internal and proprietary forecast shows, especially North America, 
and Europe with significant down volumes into 2023 and, and even beyond. But as I said before, nobody really has the crystal ball right now and, and those numbers could eventually even be worth um, and really depend on, on many factors from infection outbreaks and, and you know, renewed containment cycles over, over supply chain disruptions um, up to government stimulus programs and uh, increasing demand volatility uh, on the consumer side. Right? But what it really shows us is that we have to shift um, to a different way of planning and, and, and budgeting. We have to shift to a scenario-based planning approach and you know, have to develop the agility to quickly respond to any new scenario as it, as it evolves. So what makes the current situation even more complex is the fact that underlying fundamental trends in the industry are, are here to stay and are not going away um, through this crisis, um, but instead probably dampen the potential recovery and, and drag it out even further. Uh, so, for example, the high double digit growth rates in China, which have been boosting the industry for so long, um, will not return. Europe will continue with their strict emission regulation and will put policies in place that require the industry to really considerably increase investments into clean air vehicles. And in the US, on the other side, um, as we see here on the left side of the slide, um, we see that the demographically implied structural demand is already 25% below 2018 sales volume. So we're talking about 4 million um, cars, which are more in the market than structurally implied. And with the growth of driving age population here in, in the US um, now approaching net zero, it's likely that any potential recovery um, will be dampened here as well, even though if we're getting out of this crisis. Um, and then last not least, adding to this perfect storm, um, the trend towards autonomous connected electric and shared mobility um, is here to stay as well. And, and we believe that most of those, those trends um, are even accelerating during this crisis. I mean, for sure there, we'll probably see some, some initial concern when it comes to sharing, um, but we are expecting increased government incentives, regulation, and even customer demand to further push vehicle electrification, especially in, in, in Europe and, and in China, where we're already seeing uh, big government incentive programs going on, um, pushing pure electric vehicles. Um, at the same time, connected and, and all the digital solutions along the entire customer journey will see a steeper adoption since people will, A, spend more time in their cars and, and then also most touch points along, along the customer journey will, will just be digital. Right? and um, OEMs and dealers are, are all shifting towards um, an online uh, experience uh, with, with their, their customers. Um, on the autonomous side, um, I think we are already seeing the start of, I, I would argue, healthy consolidation in, in the startup and tech world, which will effectively help to accelerate the development, especially in the US and China. Europe might run the risk here to, to fall further behind, uh, because most OEMs and suppliers there are reducing their exposure given the current situation, as we have seen with, with the recent examples um, and, and announcements. So, you know, if, if we look at, at this slide here, <clears throat> I think, in fact, this turns um, actually out to be really this critical inflection point for, for the traditional players in the industry um, in their race towards a leading position in, in technology and innovation, actually, um, especially since deep pocketed tech players are actively using this opportunity now to double down their efforts and, and outspend legacy players as those are cutting back and um, sitting at the sideline, basically. Yeah. We have all seen the recent announcement of Intel buying MoveIt, um, Waymo, and, and just recently Rivian. Um, raising huge uh, external rounds, and Amazon buying Sooks, and I think buying Sooks with a with a much bigger ambition than just thinking about autonomous package delivery. Right, so I think they will they want to play a much much bigger role in the entire new mobility ecosystem. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, long long story short, if, if OEMs and and suppliers don't want to sit at the sideline, uh, <clears throat> we believe they have to aggressively continue their investments in future technologies. Um, which it in itself presents them with some really tough choices about where to free up funding in their core business or in other areas um, to keep investing in those new 
businesses and 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 innovation activities and and i think this is this is the point where um many are asking themselves what are what are interesting models what are potential models uh, one could apply um to really balance the risk here while uh, you know keeping the foot on the gas pedal and and, and continue investing um, in innovation and new technology um having said all this um unfortunately we believe the worst is yet to come for the industry. Um, both OEMs and suppliers have obviously been hit hard in the first quarter and the second quarter with profitability down 50, 60% year over year. And you know, a sustained downturn over multiple years as we have just seen before, um, driven by the current pandemic. Um, secondly, a, a dampening recovery given the underlying structural trends uh, we have just talked about. Um, and the ongoing need to continue investments into future technologies will really put OEMs into an increasingly tough spot and, and we can expect them to continue doing what they have always been doing and which is to, to pass on the pressure down, down the value chain, which, which is then obviously hitting the supplier space um, uh, extremely hard. Um, so what we have done here and what this slide shows actually is we wanted to get an understanding about um, you know the, the health of, of the current industry and the supply base and we have run an analysis of the top US suppliers and, and have simulated basically their P&L and balance sheets based on our prolonged downturn scenario which I, I have showed you earlier actually um, and the results are not pretty. 35% um, of US suppliers are not recession ready with 2020 net debt to EBTA ratios reaching above four. And if we would model a deep recession scenario with a longer lockdown periods or continuous lockdown periods as we are starting to see now in the US um, and an economic recession similar to the 2008 and 2009 crisis, the number even increases to 60% of US suppliers not being recession ready. Um, so in other words, we are indeed at a very critical point for the whole industry. And we believe that our actions now are very important and will determine how we are getting out of this. Um, with this, I would like to hand over to Mark, uh, who will guide us through a playbook for the supplier industry specifically, which we have implemented with many of our clients and which we believe works very well in, in, in this situation. Um, Mark, you can take it away. Thank you, Tom. Well, you've gotten all the bad news from Tom. Hopefully I will be able to turn this as an inflection point from, uh, from the negatives to, uh, to some positives. But we do think that the industry is in a situation today that is probably unique, maybe unique in the last century with all of the, uh, the races, uh, technologies coming into play right at the time when we have this, uh, this pandemic and the reduction in capital available for innovation and so on. And you can see here, this is just, this is early numbers of the reductions that people have put in R&D and CapEx. Now, the, you know, the, the issue here is, what's this gonna mean? Um, particularly, what does it mean for the race's um, uh, trends? What's it mean for the, the pace of techno technological change? And what does it mean for individual suppliers? And how do you make more with less in an environment where there isn't as much sales, profitability has gone down, there just aren't as many dollars to go around, and, and many of the suppliers in, are in distress. Well, Tom, if you go to the next slide, um, one, of, one of the things you want to be, if you think about it, going forward, you want to be in a position where you make critical investments that have a high payback, that you're very efficient in the use of your capital. What this is looking at right here is, it's looking at it across about 516 companies and it's looking at how much they invested, which is the X axis or horizontal axis on this chart. And then the vertical axis is the returns that they got on the, uh, the R&D that they spent. Obviously where you want to be, and this, this covers more than just the auto industry, but what you'd like to be is in the upper left hand or grayed out quadrant that we have here where you're an efficiency hero. You would like to be able to, to think clearly, you have less money to spend, let's spend it in the right way, let's spend it in a way that has a really high payback. And about 25% you know, of companies fall into that, uh, that gray area 
today, and, uh, and but, but those are the ones that are really outperforming the market. And that would be the objective that you have here. Invest your money smart. But if you do that, it makes a huge difference. Um, as Tom mentioned earlier, this is the time when, when market share shifts really occur. When money becomes constrained, the thoughtfulness about how you invest becomes the key to how you perform going out into the future. And you can see here, coming out of the 2009 uh, you know, Great Recession, there was a real, a real difference between those that, uh, that came out in an agile way and performed well versus the ones that did not and how they, how they performed over time. And you can look at this through, through multiple lenses. You can look at it from a market share standpoint and there is absolutely no question that that recession was a, uh, was a catalyst for real market share changes. And we believe that this one will be as well. What did those companies that did well do? Well, they, they went back from just pure budgeting to much improved and much more sophisticated scenario planning, which we could talk a lot about. They were quick in taking out cost. They lowered their break even point to the worst case scenario. They, uh, they, they zero based what they did. And, uh, and they also ended up being very involved in M&A, which is in some cases counterintuitive because you're short of cash. How do you go out and do an M&A? But doing the smart M&A frequently makes real sense. Go to the next slide, Tom. So, like I said, we think that, uh, that this is a critical in inflection point. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the racist trends are going to continue. People are going to have less money. Being really thoughtful is going to matter here. So we do think that there will be consolidation, that that's going to make sense. I'm going to talk about that in a minute in an example. We think that, uh, that complexity, um, and over specification will need to be cut dramatically. You just can't spend on frivolous things. We think, you know, unfortunately, as you think about the big trends, many of them require platform winners, which means that not everybody's gonna be able to win with what we call the new technologies or what will become engine two or the new growth vehicles for many suppliers. So. If you wanna be one of the ones who's a winner, you need to take advantage of that today. You need to think about how to get to scale. We're already seeing the traditional tier structure in the industry begin to erode. OEMs are starting to reach down um, and, and, and develop contracts with what have traditionally been tier two or tier three suppliers. In fact, we've even seen um, OEMs going and trying to negotiate directly with lithium miners to ensure that they have uh, continuity of lithium supply as electric vehicles take off. And then the last trend here is that uh, whereas a lot of the differ differentiation was in hardware in the past, both the vehicle, the engine, and so on and so forth in the future, it's all going to be about the semiconductors and it's going to be about software. Um, next one. So if you are a, uh, a player, supplier today, what do you need to do? We think that probably more than any other time, it's time to revisit your strategy. You've got to protect your core. You've got to select in, and, and invest in some growth areas. The industry is changing. There's gonna be different volumes. There's gonna be electric vehicles. There's gonna be more electronics. Knowing where the growth areas are and selectively investing to play in those are gonna be critical. You're gonna to have to be very smart about how you apply your R&D and your CapEx You've got to be very effective and efficient at that. And if you are, you have the opportunity to be one of the winners here. And then finally, of course, there are the no brainer steps that you have to take, which is you have to drive operational and commercial excellence. You've got to be able to take out costs. You've got to be able to zero base the things that you do. Go back to the drawing board and think about if you were starting from scratch, what are the costs that you need? What do you need to do? You also need to be really thinking about the, uh, the muscles that you have commercially, because there's many, many new programs, many new platforms coming online, many of them electric. They, uh, they're gonna require a new set of suppliers and how are you gonna play in that field and how are you going to win? Next slide, Tom. One of the ways that we think about this as you think about um, your portfolio of, of components that you provide or products that you provide to the industry, 
is to look at that portfolio and think about, first of all, again, on the horizontal axis here, how can, what is your competitive position? We think of this in terms of relative market share. Relative market share is defined by your market share divided by the market share of the largest player in your category or business. So that if you're the leader, you would have a relative market share of more than one. If there is somebody who's bigger than you in that business, you would have a relative market share of less than one. And you can see that you can go from a strong position. If your relative market share is 0.8 or greater, it means that you are a leader or a co-leader. Or if you have a relative market share of 0.4 or less, it would mean that you are a, a distant follower. And then the second lens here is to look at the segment attractiveness. How large is it? How much it is, is it going to be growing? What's the profitability of the industry? These are measures of how, how attractive this market is now and potentially in the future. And there's a series of actions you would take depending on where your position is. Obviously, if you are in the upper right-hand corner, you want to leverage that position. You want to drive and defend it at all costs. In the lower left-hand corner you, corner, you might consider divesting. You might consider selling to somebody for whom that product is worth more than it is to you somebody who could who could be a leader go to the next chart and i'll just share with you a little bit of an example of of uh, of this this is this is looking at a, a supplier that we have worked closely with over the last couple of years to help them think through these very issues this is just looking at their sales they're they're a large um, oem supplier a tier one supplier and they play in a number of areas. You can see here from, from powertrain to new technology to after sales. And the coloring here is the red are um, components that go into internal combustion engines. The gray are what I would call conventional or classic parts, which means they're on vehicles, whether electric or um, ICE vehicles. And then the green is all about uh, the new technologies, whether it's ADAS or whether it's electrification of the vehicle or electric vehicles. And you can see that, uh, that there's obviously going to be different growth dynamics going into the future. So we worked with this company and then we, we also laid over the, uh, the framework that I just showed, which is their relative market share. And what we discovered is that they really had a dog's breakfast of, uh, of, of components in their portfolio. And so we worked with them to take a, a few actions. One was there were a lot of um, their components that are distant followers that they were unlikely to be leaders in and were likely to decline over time. And so we packaged up those into groups of portfolios of components and ended up selling them off in packages. We, uh, we ended up making about four divestitures of significant amounts of components. And then we looked at the other side, which is how do we strengthen our position in some of the ice uh, related components. We said, look, we're strong, we could become stronger, and we ought to take a last man standing approach, be the last real supplier in this, and let's consolidate it a little bit. And so let's acquire some of the weaker players, consolidate our position, and, uh, and become really the, uh, the, the real leader. And, uh, and then also we need, to, we need to invest in some new technologies and strengthen our position there so that we will have the resources to lead in some of the new electrification technologies. That has led to four acquisitions. Um, one of them has been consummated. The other three are scheduled to close in the next couple of months, but we'll put them so that their portfolio is about 85% of their component positions will be in leadership positions in their industry. They'll also be extremely well hedged um, looking at uh, the potential decline in ICE as, as the, uh, the ICE vehicles decline, their electric vehicle related components should grow and really provide them a hedge for stability going into the future, which we think makes a, a very sensible strategy for them. Next slide, Tom. So what are the things that we think that suppliers need to be doing now? Well, we think first of all, there are the no brainer actions that you have to take. You've got to generate as much cash as you can from your current business. You can do that through cost reduction in, in direct and indirect procurement, SG&A. Every single cost needs to be looked at, but you also need to be thinking about capacity and footprint. You've, you've got to look at this R&D and figure out how much you can actually spend 
and then think about doing it in the most efficient and effective way, very strategic. You've got to then think about uh, how you grow your core business and that gets to what I was talking about in terms of commercial excellence. How are you going to ensure that you are on the platforms that are being developed going forward? How do you penetrate uh, the current OEMs that you have further and how do you get into new OEMs, particularly for many companies, it will be around growth areas like China and so on. And then finally, we think almost every company needs to have something in the engine two category, which is what are going to be, what are you going to be your growth um, areas in the future? How are you going to fund those? How are you going to think about some M&A to get the capabilities that you need? Or, or might you do some partnering? These are the three actions that we, we think need to be the, the core set of activities that you need to go through. So I think uh, I'll leave it, leave it there. And uh, uh, thank you very much for listening. And we'll uh, go back to, uh, to Adam and, and Mark and, uh, and happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. And, and um, I, I think it's a really interesting presentation. I think, you know, everybody who's viewing right now is, is I'm sure, getting a lot of value out of it, if, if the, <laughs> the questions are any uh, indication anyway. So we've received quite a few different questions. Um, so I might have to combine them a little bit. But, but one of them, for example, was, um, you know, given all the uncertainty with COVID-19 and everything that's going on right now, basically, when is the right time to determine you know, what your strategy is moving forward. And, and also kind of part two of that question is, you know, given the historically, you know, sometimes slow reaction by, by OEMs or the automotive industry, you know, what do you suggest for companies who are attempting to provide innovative and lower cost solutions to those OEMs? So two questions there. Um, the first one on timing, um, it, it, you should have started a year ago. <laughs> You know, sh short answer on this is that the, the timing is actually really critical. Right now is, is critically important, and here's why. I made the comment that we think that many of these uh, Engine 2 growth platforms are going to be winner-take-most kinds of things. And so I think that as we, as we see some consolidation, there already is a mad scramble for positions in many of these technologies. And if you are late to the party, you have the real risk of being left out. And here, you know, here's the issue. Right at the moment, everybody's concerned about, can I get my workers back? Can I, can I get production going? Can I, can I, uh, you know, can I follow through? Can I get, can I get product even out the door? What, how's my supply chain working? And as you're dealing with all of these very, very urgent issues, the tendency is to not look at the long term, And yet, Right now is the time to actually look at that because if, if you are left out, you will be an underperformer. There's really no question about that. And then the second one is resources are constrained. And so being very smart about this is, is really critical. And it, it, you know, in the, in the case example that I gave, uh, you know, we ended up making some divestitures. Those packaging up those parts that were not going to be winners for us in the future was a really critical element of generating cash, in addition to all of the operational things that need to be done. So, Tom, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think this uh, this this answers the question uh, very well. I think what what I would maybe add is um, about the timing. You know, I mean, if you look at the space, um, everybody is starting to make their bets right now, and and there's a lot of M and A opportunity going on and, and M and A activity going on right now. Um, so yeah, the right time is is really now. If you haven't already started, um, I think you should now. Great. Yeah, and then um, a follow up question to that are, you know, what successful models are you seeing for corporates in general? and for suppliers who are specifically trying to engage with early stage innovation or potentially the startup ecosystem? Yeah, great, great question. I think, um, I mean, <laughs> first, first question here or first answer here is um, probably should we continue to do that and should we continue to engage with early stage startups? And, and you know, the clear answer here is um, yes, we should, um, because the, the pace of innovation is, is so fast and, and, you know, you really want to have your eyes and ears 
um, out there in, in the innovation ecosystem and see what's going on. Um, and then secondly, also you want to be seen um, as a trusted and reliable partner. So, you know, many, many uh, corporates, typical corporate behavior is, um, when it comes to budget cuts, first thing we are cutting is our innovation activities in Silicon Valley, our corporate venture funds, and and this is this is such a tight community um, that you know that that doesn't go well with the community. So you really want to be seen as a as a strong and consistent partner here. Um, what 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 you know interesting and successful models are, is I think there is a bunch of models. Um, people are, are using and applying, you know, um, there's obviously corporate venture uh, models, um, which is interesting um, to really look beyond the horizon, have eyes and ears out there and get, get, into, get into and see new innovation technologies early, earlier than your competitor does, right? Um, and then there is on the other side um, of the spectrum is, is more like a, a closer to the core business approach, which is, which is kind of a venture client platform model, um, for example, BMW, um, Startup Garage. So we really have a predefined problem, white spot in technology, and you're going out there and you're looking for startups who can help you fill this. You can bring in those startups um, to set up partnerships immediately, which, which optimize your, your products right now. So there's a, there's a whole bandwidth. Um, I think important to mention here is that uh, it's hard to do all those things alone. And that's why you know such a model like plug and play um, I think is a great model to to really um, be engaged in, in in this community and and just have somebody who is uh, who has reputation help you um, you know be be a good part and member of this community. Great. Yeah, and I think you know I'm being cognizant of the time, so maybe just one more question, um, which is you, you spoke about M and A activity in order to strengthen positioning in the market for a supplier. But could you talk about maybe some of the larger mergers that are going on, like FCA and PSA, for example, at the OEM level, and if you see need for more to occur in order to maintain stability in the industry? So, short answer to that is, for stability in the industry, there really should be some consolidation that goes on. We see in the FCA and the PSA um, merger and the, uh, the regulatory issues associated with that, how how tricky that really is actually to happen because most uh, most countries, if they have a, an automotive capability, view it as a national asset. And so there are some real challenges to making it happen. Um, short answer is, I think we will see um, some of this going on. One place in particular where that is likely to be the case is in China where there are really too many um, car makers uh, that have developed in that market. That needs to be consolidated and the industry in general should be consolidated it particularly one, some of the, one of the places you see the particular weakness is in countries that don't have their own indigenous um, you know vehicle manufacturing so you take a, a market like Argentina that has a sales of about 400,000 vehicles but has 17 uh, different automotive makers selling vehicles in the market makes it very very tricky so short answer is yes, it should happen. There are some significant barriers and therefore it's very difficult to predict which ones will actually come to, come to pass at this point. Okay. Maybe just adding um, quickly that, you know, this is exactly the reason why we're also seeing many more loose partnerships going on like, you know, VW and Ford, I mean, as, as the latest example, I think this is, this is what we might see in an increasing uh, level to, to really see people partner um, on new technology platforms to really uh, share um, and, and get to increased scale here. Absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, I, again, I'm cognizant of the time. I want to make sure that we can get to the startups. We do have quite a few unanswered questions. So if it's all right with you guys, maybe I'll put a couple people in touch with you or maybe they can continue this conversation. Um, yeah. But yeah. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I think it's been great. And, you know, I'd like to hand it over to Mark to introduce some of our startups. For sure. Again, thanks so much, Tom and Mark and, and uh, Adam for facilitating. I just have a quick slide here. I'm on the clock, but uh, thanks everybody for joining. Want to bring maybe some of the startup uh, kind of perspective to this conversation as well. We mentioned, I think, a few times in this presentation that um, collaborating with startups and some faster moving smaller companies is definitely an area um, of, of kind of innovation and improvement for, for the automotive sector. 
Really quickly touching on some high level, uh, kind of more positive trends that we're seeing from an early stage investment perspective, uh, just before getting into startups, micromobility, we've all heard kind of the downturn of some of the shared platform models, but there's also an uptick um, in e-bike sales, something really shocking, over 250% jump in sales and uh, kind of a long-term trend towards less commuting, especially as certain tech firms uh, reduce their in-person workforces and make everyone remote. Something that we'll get to with locomation actually uh, also is a growth stage uh, autonomy being enabled by a lot of dry powder from later stage funds, um, as well as logistics tailwinds from COVID. Uh, I think that can be a really exciting place for innovation as well. Uh, certainly one we're looking at. And then finally, um, the landscape, I guess, when we're trying to compare for early stage VC from uh, the last financial downturn, looking at it now has really changed uh, for, for the kind of seed and angel stage investments that we're looking at. Um, we have much more involvement from uh, from more corporate VCs, non-traditional venture capital, um, and it'll be interesting to see how they weather this current uh, kind of economic downturn in COVID. But kind of in parallel, some hope here as well as we're looking at it from from the the early funding side of things is a, a wealth of new founders, some founders who may be seeing more opportunity right now than they did before to go and start a company. So, uh, you know, we're all balancing this and getting to know those folks virtually and, and hopefully investing in some great companies. But um, I will jump straight to our uh, first startup and maybe a little bit of run a show here on the next slide. We'll start with Gardnox and we'll be looking at Locomation and Roadster. Um, quick reminder that you have the Q&A box. You can submit questions for these founders and we'll go ahead and answer them live after a quick video presentation. So without further ado, uh, we'll let Gardnox take the stage. Hi, I'm Jillian Goldberg from Gardnox. We are a leading global cyber tech tier supplier. Before we get started today, I want to take a second and introduce you to the Gardnox team. We're all coming from the Israel, Israeli Air Force, where we actually built the cyber defense systems still currently deployed in our fighter jets, as well as our missile defense systems, such as the ones you see here. We've done this before. Coming from moving platforms, we've been able to leverage our background in innovation to provide secured and high performance computing platforms for the automotive industry. A quick look at the company. We are currently working with over seven different OEMs and have projects with all of them, as well as six tier one suppliers. We have eight worldwide partnerships, both technological as well as strategic to provide us full end-to-end -end solutions, as well as have the ability to provide solutions to all geographies. A quick look at some of our investors. We are really proud of this esteemed list of investors, including VCs from the United States, the EU, as well as China. We consider our investors part of our partners, and that's why I'm also proud to give you a quick sneak peek of our advisory board, as well as our board of directors. What's currently going on in the automotive industry? We're currently seeing a paradigm shift, and what's currently happening in the world today is only accelerating that shift. We're seeing a shift to the software-defined vehicle, where the driver or the passenger is at the focal point rather than the vehicle itself. And we are seeing this every day. When I leave the store, I want to be able to customize my vehicle to my evolving needs. This is the cyber tech tier, the bridge to the new automotive paradigm. But what is a cyber tech tier? This might sound new to you. It's because Gardnox is the first chartering this new territory. A cyber tech tier supplier fits right into the existing value chain, providing services to the tier one, to the manufacturer, as well as the aftermarket. Gardnox has decades of experience in defense aviation and in moving platforms, and this has led to our five patents, as well as a number more in the future. We are very proud to have two, and actually soon to be three, patents on automotive services-oriented architecture. With Gardnox in our vehicle, because of our secure SOA, we're able to have a customized experience to download apps, apart from that initial sale and to generate once again more revenue for the OEM. Let's talk about what our platform looks like. Our series of platforms provide domain controllers as you see here. Here we're also seeing our secure software stack with a separation between safety critical and non-safety critical systems. Thank you so much. 
Great. Thanks so much, Jillian. I believe uh, we have Jillian as well as Moshe on the line from Gardnox. Um, if you go ahead and unmute yourselves. Um, really excited to have you here and certainly looking to field some Q&A uh, from the audience. And I think maybe a quick question to kick things off is, um, you know, cybersecurity, I think, is probably one of the dark horses in terms of uh, connectivity and, and uh, considerations of priorities for a vehicle. How are you seeing uh, the conversation around uh, around cybersecurity in the car right now, given that there might be other priorities with automakers? Um, let me start with Moshe. Um, the, the good news that we is that we don't need to answer that question because the United Nation and uh, ISO organization answered that for us. And of course, all the OEMs, the United Nation just uh, published a governance document that says that as of 2022, it will uh, enforce uh, in Europe and in the US the regulations for cybersecurity for vehicles. And of course, it, the, the, um, the regulation that was mentioned is ISO 21434, which we were uh, a contributing partner to write the standards. So from, uh, from our perspective, it's uh, very good news. Uh, and uh, we believe that the more the, the car is connected, the more uh, cybersecurity as a foundation layer is going to be needed. Gotcha. Uh, that, that totally makes sense. And, and maybe another, another quick question here. I know we're a little tight on time, but can you speak to maybe one of the highlight partnership or more successful partnership that you all have had um, and kind of uh, what has led to that success? Uh, I will take this question um, in the light of uh, the, the COVID pandemic because um, we were able to uh, move forward with uh, quite a lot of uh, the ones because of uh, personal relations that um, we took the decision to move uh, into that direction a year ago, as was mentioned. Uh, and uh, we, we understood that the only thing that uh, uh, can bring us into the place where people will trust us is not only our technology, but personal relations. So investing a lot of time in getting to know the decision makers as well as the engineers in different levels. And um, now we see that, uh, that it pays off because we are heading into um, some, some contracts that we're expecting to be signed uh, very soon. So from our perspective, uh, investing even in those kind of days, investing uh, the time in creating those relationships, uh, answering the, the pain points of uh, the customer in understanding their limitation uh, during those days uh, when you're a startup and you are used to move very fast and adjust yourself. Uh, that, uh, that's, in my view, that brings uh, us into a much better position. For sure, definitely some wise advice for, for any founders on the line. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, thanks so much, Moshe and, and Jillian for your time. And uh, if you'd like to follow up anyone in the audience, uh, I put Jillian's email address on here, um, but feel free to reach out to myself additionally. I'll be happy to connect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, and up next, we'll have Locomation presenting. They're working on autonomous trucking. So again, back to some of those trends that we were talking about. Um, really excited to have uh, Chetan join from Locomation. Hi, I'm Chetan Mirishte, co-founder and CEO of Locomation. Locomation develops safe and reliable self-driving technologies for semi-trucks. Trucking industry that transports 70% of everything we use is in severe pain. On one hand, we rely more and more on online shopping, driving the shipping demand up. On the other hand, trucking suffers from an increasing skilled driver shortage and chronic low asset utilization. Autonomous driving can alleviate those pain points, but we have been witnessing a strong rectification in expectations from self-driving technology. This is not a surprise because replacing a human driver completely with a machine is an incredibly difficult problem. We address this problem by combining superior cognition capability of humans with precise control capability of robots to introduce the first commercially available autonomous trucking solution. We deploy two truck convoys where the front truck has an engaged human driver acting as a superior cognitive filter of the system, and the second truck follows the lead truck fully autonomously. The result is 30% reduction in operating expenses and twice as much capacity increase. In our solution, two trucks form a convoy on the interstate. The driver in the lead truck remains in control with autonomy assistance and the second truck drives itself. 
One engaged driver and two moving trucks saves half the labor cost, and both trucks save an average of 8% fuel due to reduced air drag with flows following. Trucks periodically swap places so the drivers can take turns being in the lead position and resting. Here's how it looks in real life. This is a view from the lead truck. The driver is manually controlling steering and acceleration. The second truck autonomously follows the lead truck. We have a subscription model with monthly payments over three years. We make $2,900 per month per truck and customers realize around $3,000 per month per truck net savings. We have our first commercial engagement signed with Wilson Logistics. It will start with two of our trucks piloting on their lanes and end with over 120 of their trucks equipped with our technology. When fully implemented, we will make $18 million revenue over three years. We have a very strong pipeline. We have a second pilot signed with a top fleet and several more in value discovery and different negotiation phases. We initially focus on large fleets in the long haul truck load space. We offer our technology in the form of an aftermarket autonomy kit and we sell autonomy as a service. We launched our company in September 2018 after raising $5.5 million seed round. In less than 18 months, we built the core team, the core technology, and made our first sales. We are now raising a new round to scale and convert our pipeline into signed commercial contracts. Please reach out if you are interested in participating. We have a very experienced team with a proven track record not only in technology development, but also freight network optimization and fleet sales. We have a very attractive business model, the most experienced team in the AV field, and a fast and capital efficient path to profitability and market dominance. Thank you very much. Please reach out if you would like to discuss more. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chetan. And uh, I believe we have you on the line as well. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and let's get your video going. Um, you know, I think there's something special in the approach that you all are taking for, uh, for this kind of autonomy in the logistics and trucking space. Um, so I'd love to maybe hear more about what you feel makes a locomotion approach so special, especially compared to, you know, full autonomy and some of the, the full stack systems that we're also seeing. Yeah, very, very quick. Uh, first of all, thanks, for, thanks so much for having me and having, having locomotion. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I think by now everybody uh, understands that when it comes to autonomous driving, Autonomous driving in the autonomous uh, trucking space, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. What locomotion is all about is it's not just a question of what, that's eventually no, no one in, on the cab, uh, fully driverless trucks all around, etc. but it's a question of how are we going to get there. And locomotion basically defines meaningful intermediate technical steps that are doable, that are verifiable for safety, that are insurable, that uh, have no operational challenges, and bundle that with proper business cases so that we deploy something, we start getting to the market as fast as we can and then quickly iterate from there on. Each product that we will offer is going to serve as a funding source and data validation source for the next one. Definitely. That's what makes us I, special. Yeah, I mean, I think it sounds, sounds like a, a wonderful roadmap for sure. Um, and then maybe a final question uh, really quickly. Can you speak to what you've seen as the trends in the trucking industry right now and, and how you're kind of working into that? given COVID? Uh, so a, a couple of uh, keywords are extremely important for fleets. Uh, yield, efficiency, and safety are the top ones. And COVID actually it impacts all of these. We are now, uh, mo they are now more, more worried than ever about uh, the safety of their drivers, the health of their drivers, and the overall asset utilization and yield of their uh, very heavy capital investment. Gotcha. Perfect. Thanks so much again. And uh, much. for the folks in the audience, you can find contact information for Chetan and uh, on this slide. And again, feel free to reach out to me. Happy to make it happen. Um, thanks so much. Thank and you so much. I believe we'll be taking it home with Roadster, looking at alternative ways to buy a car, uh, ones that might be more practical given uh, the state of things currently. So I will go ahead and uh, let Roadster take the stage. Meet Jen. She knows what her customers want when buying a car. Ease, efficiency, transparency, and trust. Of course, her dealership has wants and needs too, like creating a better buying experience, cutting costs, and selling more cars in less time. That's why they partnered with Roadster. Meet Chris. He's a busy guy, so whenever he gets the chance to speed up and simplify something, he takes it. Like car buying. 
between projects, he browses cars on the Express Store and easily finds the car he wants. He scrolls, he clicks, he toggles, he slides, and he has to get back to work. Of course, Jen is seeing all of Chris's actions on her end of the platform. Roadster even sends messages to Chris on Jen's behalf, inviting him to take the next step. When Chris comes into the showroom, Jen pulls up the deal he started building online. They review the car's features, and it's time for a test drive. Afterward, they walk around Chris's trade-in and snap a few photos. Jen recommends wheel and tire protection for his new car, just in case that curb tries to jump up and bite him again. All of Chris's trade-in info is automatically pushed into Viato, and within just a few minutes, both Jen and Chris receive a text with an offer for his current car. Back at Jen's desk, they complete the first pencil of Chris's new car purchase side by side. Together, they review and select the FNI packages and arrive at a monthly rate that works for Chris. After completing a quick credit app and uploading a photo of his driver's license and insurance card, Chris is ready to meet with the FNI manager. They review the deal terms one last time and Chris signs the final deal sheet electronically. He opts to have his new car delivered to his office and makes it back in time for his next meeting. Simple, fast, convenient, empowering. The way car buying and selling should be. Excellent. And I believe we have a Mitt on the line from Roadster to kind of take us home here. I'd love to, to chat a little bit about what you all are building and maybe give you an opportunity as well to, to highlight uh, maybe the, the more business aspect of Roadster. I know the video is a little bit short. Yeah, no problem, Chris. Hey, uh, Mark, sorry. Thanks for having us. My name is Amit Chandarana. I'm the SVP at uh, Roadster. Uh, as you can see from the video, we're essentially an omni-channel commerce platform, aka known as digital retailing. Um, we work with about 1,500 dealer partners in North America and several OEMs directly in uh, India, Latin America, and in Europe. And essentially what we provide is a digitization of the sales process. Um, it's not necessarily about selling online only. It is genuinely still an omni-channel approach. Uh, and it really comes down to three value propositions that, the cust that Roadster offers our dealer partners, which is number one, efficiency getting more people to do uh, more items, whether or not it's through the dealership standpoint or whether or not it's from a customer standpoint, engagement. Um, actually buying vehicles is, is a arduous process. It's actually not very engaging and therefore adding higher levels of engagement through a digital process is uh, beneficial to not only to the retailers, but the OEMs. And last, uh, satisfaction. Not only customer satisfaction because ultimately this is how they have to or want to purchase nowadays, uh, but it's also a satisfaction level for the associates at dealerships, which has a a massive trickle-down effect to associate retention and uh, an overall happiness of uh, the associates in the in the retail industry. So I think uh, our technology really uh, goes back to some of the things you guys were talking about earlier on, which is it is addressing the evolving changes, and it's now a part of a fundamental component of how vehicles are sold uh, globally. For sure. Yeah, and I think maybe something interesting to touch on up from Roadster's perspective is the interaction between the different stakeholders. So whether they be uh, the OEMs, uh, the, the actual uh, dealerships themselves, where do you sit at that interface? Where do you see yourselves adding value? Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly, the, the technology is being utilized by retailers or by dealers to facilitate the car purchase process. But then there's the back half of this. If you think about it, we've essentially digitized the sales process. So we now have a helicopter view of the entire sales process from inception of when someone starts a process through a website all the way through taking delivery. So as an ex-OEM person, I would have uh, jumped for that type of data, that treasure trove of information of where customers are, where uh, during the entire sales process, where they leave off and where we can re-engage them. Um, we are now seeing OEMs actually take that, that tier three or retail approach and implement that in their tier one environments, such as their websites, uh, basically attaching a customer to this beautiful environment at tier one, directly to that engaging uh, opportunity to actually sell the vehicle at tier three. For sure. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, a different aspect to connectivity when we talk about it. Maybe one that's less vehicle-centric, more consumer-centric. I, I like that concept. Um, you know, I guess maybe can you speak briefly kind of to wrap up here towards the trajectory of Roadster plans for, for this year? Yeah, so we've certainly seen an uptick, right? I mean, of course, nobody ever wishes for a global pandemic to be a catalyst. But if you look at the typical adoption curve, uh, we've certainly contracted. 
uh, about a year and a half out of that, right? Uh, the, the adoption curve that we believe that dealers would have used to uh, engage in this technology. Um, so a year and a half has been taken out of it. We've uh, certainly advanced, nearly doubled the size of the company from our partners. Um, and we're just continuing to stay focused on the development of the product, the change management that we support, because that is primarily what this is. At the end of the day, 20% technology and 80% change management in the retail world. So we're doubling down our focus on our efforts with our partners, uh, ensuring that the product continues to get better, uh, and then inviting uh, other inquiries in regards to how we can partner globally. For sure. Excellent. Well, we really appreciate your time, Amit. And uh, for those in the audience, got the contact info up there as well. So feel free to reach out. Thanks, Mark. Cool. Peace. Um, and I think that about takes us home here. So uh, a little bit over time, but really appreciate everybody uh, sticking around. And I, again, thank you to our, uh, our the partners at Bain, Tom and Mark, for joining us and, and Adam for facilitating. I think this was a great session. I don't know if I'll have Adam jump back on briefly. Sure, sure. Yeah, so as Mark said, thank you again so much to, to Tom and Mark from Bain. Um, definitely a great session. Thank you also to the three startups who presented. Um, basically, if anybody in the audience would like an introduction to any of them, um, either the startups or, or Bain and Company, please reach out to either Mark Boucher on our side or myself, Adam Jansen. Our emails are mb at pmptc or adam at pmptc.com. Uh, just real quick, also another upcoming event, as I said in the beginning, uh, we're gonna have the, the first of our launch activities for Plug and Play Detroit in September. Uh, on the first through the third, there's going to be Michigan Minority Procurement Conference. We'll be doing a presentation there. So, uh, you know, please save the date. And yeah, thanks again for joining everyone. Um, if you, like I said, if you'd like to reach out, my email address, we'll leave it on the screen here for a second. It's right there. Uh, I'm happy to talk about Plug and Play Detroit, startup technologies, scheduling a deal flow or a trial deal flow, or any other upcoming events. So thank you again.